topics of discussion right now here in Washington, D.C. Uh, actually, there are many different topics of discussion, but one of those is infrastructure. And depending on who you will ask, you're likely to get different answers on what exactly people mean when they say the word infrastructure. When I and my constituents in Texas think about infrastructure, we think about our highways and bridges. Uh, those are two of the big things that come to mind. We are the home to the largest network of highways in the nation, as well as the largest number of bridges. And these structures are supporting more and more Texans by the day. It's no secret that in the last decade, Texas has grown by nearly 4 million people, roughly the population of our neighbor to the north, Oklahoma. If we, want, if we want to get all 29 million Texans and our visitors and our crucial commercial cargo around the state safely and efficiently, we need a reliable network of transportation infrastructure. And there's a lot of room for improvement over the status quo. Every year, the American Civil Society of Civil Engineers evaluates America's infrastructure and issues a report card letting us know how we're doing. Well, America is barely passing with a C minus. Texas is faring only slightly better with the rest of the class with a C. There's no doubt about it. It is time for an investment in our infrastructure. And now more than ever, that investment must be made responsibly. We just spent trillions of dollars to help the American people and our economy get through a pandemic. And our national debt is at, as, at its highest level since World War II. I've told my friends back home, this is a domestic equivalent to World War. We didn't ask in World War II, how much money can we spend? We needed to defeat our enemies, and we did. And then we need to come together responsibly and figure out how to pay for it. Well. We don't need to quit spending altogether, but we surely must take a closer look at what's necessary and what's desirable and what is something we'd like to have but could be put off for another day. Think of the Goldilocks principle. Not too hot, not too cold. In this case, not too small, not too big. We need to find the right size, and we need to agree on what that means. The most recent highway and transit funding bill to come before that came, became law was the FAST Act of 2015. That bill came in right around $300 billion. And last Congress, before the pandemic hit, it looked like we were poised to pass a similar bill at roughly the same price tag. I think we can all agree that now something of that size is probably too small. We need to invest in our infrastructure, repair our roads, our bridges, our airports, our levees, and other transportation infrastructure that's long overdue. The pandemic has highlighted the need to expand that definition, though, for example, to strengthen broadband and internet access. For many Americans, the daily commutes to work or school have been replaced by virtual classrooms and telework. Our 21st century economy and society depend on internet connections, and we need to do more to improve access, especially in rural areas where the big internet companies don't find it commercially advantageous to offer service. Republicans and Democrats agree that this time around we need a larger investment in our nation's infrastructure, but frankly, the proposal from President Biden is far too big. The Nonpartisan Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget estimates it would cost an additional $2.65 trillion, roughly nine times the recent highway bill that became law. And that's on top of the $1.9 trillion that the Senate majority and the House and the President just passed into law purportedly for additional COVID-19 relief, although only about 10 percent of it actually addressed COVID-19. But the point is, we've been spending a lot of money, and we can't keep spending money that we are borrowing from future generations. Well, not surprisingly, the president's uh, 
infrastructure bill is only a fraction of it is dedicated to roads and bridges, 5%, in fact. The vast majority of the funding goes toward a long list of programs and policies that are unrelated to infrastructure. For example, caregiving for the elderly and disabled, community colleges, programs to improve diversity in STEM careers, all of those are important topics, but they're not infrastructure. And we shouldn't be paying for it by borrowing money from future generations. We ought to figure appropriate offsets and pay for us like we used to do here before the pandemic hit. So our job is to find the right size bill that suits our needs without going overboard with unnecessary and unrelated spending. Fortunately, Senator Capito, the senator from West Virginia, is leading the way to find that Goldilocks just right fit. She and a number of our colleagues have outlined to President Biden and our Democratic colleagues a framework to improve our nation's infrastructure. The plan they've proposed comes in at $568 billion, more than we spent in the past, but far less than the President's proposal. When we talk about the need for bipartisan compromise, this is a, a great place to start. The Republican plan includes nearly $300 billion for roads and bridges, two and a half times the President's plan for roads and bridges. It also invests in airports, drinking and wastewater, ports and waterways, broadband, and some of the most urgent infrastructure priorities in our country. Last week, Senator Capito and five of our Republican colleagues met with Vice President Harris and President Biden to discuss a path forward. They apparently had a productive meeting, and the President seemed to be receptive to many of the ideas that were shared. I hope this is the starting point for a consensus package that addresses our infrastructure needs. But here's the question that almost nobody wants to talk about. But thank you, thanks to Senator Ron Wyden of Oregon, Senator Mike Crapo of Idaho, we actually had a hearing on this this morning, a virtual hearing in the Senate Finance Committee to answer that taboo question that nobody really wants to talk about, which is how do we pay for it? As I said, this was the subject of a Senate Finance Committee hearing this morning, and I'm sure some of the ideas that were put forward then will begin to start to take um, traction and hopefully lead us to a way to responsibly pay for uh, this infrastructure bill. In the past, funding for infrastructure bills has come from the Highway Trust Fund, but for years it has faced severe shortfalls. To a serious degree, my constituents in Texas have footed the bill for those shortfalls. We're one of the few states, for example, that receives less than it contributes to the Highway Trust Fund. In other words, we're a donor state. For every dollar we put into the Highway Trust Fund, we get 95%, 95 cents back. Well, that's not the same treatment every state is getting. In fact, we have a lower rate of return than every other state. If we want to have any long-term successes in maintaining our roads and bridges, we have to bring this formula up to date. And it has to be equitable. The smart spending, though, can't stop there. We need to repurpose the mountain of unused federal funds from the so-called COVID-19 relief bill. The states are awash with cash that they frankly don't know how to spend. The massive $1.9 trillion bill became law without support of a single Republican because it was so extravagant and poorly targeted. Case in point, the blue state bailout. This legislation sent $350 billion additional dollars to state and local governments, many of which were not facing any budgetary shortfalls. We started to see a flurry of news stories in the past few weeks that demonstrate exactly why we were opposed to this reckless spending. For example, California has reported a $75 billion budget surplus, a massive amount of money. Governor Newsom says this will be used to pay down past state debts, 
send direct checks to Californians and add to their rainy day fund. In addition to California, you've got New York, Colorado, Michigan, Minnesota. Each of these states are expected to have more than a billion dollar surplus, again, because of the massive shoveling of cash out of Washington, D.C. into the states that was not targeted at COVID-19 relief. This is exactly why we advocated against this tidal wave of funding for states that weren't even operating in the red. Taxpayer dollars shouldn't be spent to erase the debts of mismanaged states or to add to their rainy day fund. They have the ability to raise revenue themselves, so it shouldn't be the responsibility of the federal taxpayer to bail them out or to provide them this huge cash cushion with them looking to try to find responsible ways to spend it. Well, tens of billions of unused dollars from this legislation should be repurposed to help cover the cost of these investments without driving down, driving our national debt even higher. It's common sense. And I actually believe, Mr. President, that there is a way to incentivize the states to use that additional cash for infrastructure purposes, whether it's through modifications and cost sharing between state and, and local government. And many of those states are struggling to find a way within the guidelines and guardrails that we provided for COVID-19 um, relief to spend it anyway. So why not spend it for infrastructure? Maybe there's a win-win there. So there are a number of ideas now on the table about how to pay for this infrastructure bill but I hope we can all agree that the massive tax hike that President Biden is proposing is not the answer. This would constitute the largest set of tax hikes in more than a half a century. And these increases would do serious damage to our economy just as we were coming out of a pandemic-induced recession. At a time when our economy is already on fragile footing, the tax burden on, American, on Americans would be greater than that of our biggest trading partners and competitors. And this would have far-reaching consequences to our competitiveness and our economy as a whole. After all, we know these tax hikes won't be reflected in lower earnings for CEOs. The brunt will be borne by consumers who will pay higher prices, workers who earn lower wages, and let's not forget those whose jobs have disappeared entirely. We're already seeing some price hikes on some of our most used consumer products, covering everything from cereal to diaper to lumbers to lumber and cars. This is not the time to increase taxes and drive inflation across our economy, which is actually a tax increase on low and middle income people. We need to find responsible ways to fund an investment in our infrastructure without hurting our economy and the people we represent. Right now, it appears that bipartisan progress is being made uh, toward that just right sized policy and paid for in a responsible way, or at least that's my optimistic hope. So I want to thank Senator Capito for her leadership on this effort and all those who have been working with our Democratic colleagues and the administration uh, to con and encourage them to continue to work with folks on our side of the aisle so we can get this done on a timely basis. 